Most of the major theoretical questions of information theory were both raised and solved by Shannon in his famous 1948 paper. But most of the questions involving finding good coding methods still remained open. And one of those questions was the problem of finding an algorithm to produce an optimal symbol code for any given PMF on a finite set. And here, optimal means minimal expected length. So the problem, let's clearly state the problem. The problem is to design an algorithm taking a PMF, taking any PMF P, maybe let's say it's P1 up to PN, and producing and outputting an optimal symbol code on the set 1 to N. And it's optimal with respect to this P in the sense that it has minimal expected length. Now, Shannon was certainly interested in solving this problem in finding such an algorithm. And in fact, in his 1948 paper, he published a method which is now referred to as Shannon Fano coding. And it's named after Robert Fano, who Shannon attributed the method to in his paper. But Shannon Fano coding is not optimal. It, is, it is no, does not always produce an optimal code. But Fano and Shannon still remained interested in this problem. And as history would have it, in 1951, Fano was teaching a course on information theory just a few years after, after Shannon's paper in 1948. And in his class, there was a student named David Huffman. Huffman was a PhD student at the time. And Fano gave the class the option of either taking a final or doing a project. And the project was to write a paper on this problem, on the problem of, of finding an algorithm to produce an optimal code. And what Fano didn't tell his class is that this was an unsolved problem at the time. Now, Huffman heard about, you know, he heard the, the option final or this problem, and he said to himself, hey, that doesn't sound too bad. I think I think I could probably solve this. That sounds like the easy that sounds like the easy way out. So he set about trying to solve this unsolved problem, although he didn't know it was unsolved. He set about trying to solve this, and as the story goes, he worked on it for several months. He worked and worked, and he wasn't getting anywhere. And as the term drew to a close, he decided that he better start studying for the final because he was not getting anywhere. But just about, just as he was about to quit, he suddenly inspiration struck, and he figured out how to solve the problem. So he wrote up his solution, and he he took it to Fano, and and Fano was just was very surprised at how simple the solution is. So of course Huffman, I'm sure, was 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 also very surprised to learn that this was an unsolved problem. And not only was it unsolved, but that the great Shannon himself, along with Fano, had worked on solving it and were unable to solve it. And later Huffman said that if he had known that, he probably would have given up. He probably wouldn't have wouldn't have spent much time trying to solve it in the first place. So Huffman ended up writing it, writing it up, and now it is known as the Huffman coding algorithm, and it's, and it's very widely used. So the beautiful thing about Huffman, not only is it optimal, but it's very, very simple. It's very easy to understand and very easy to implement. And so rather than dive into the proof of the optimality of Huffman coding, I'd first like to go through some examples, work through some examples, of how to actually do the algorithm, how to implement it. And I'd like, I'd like to do some examples rather than giving a formal description because I think it's easier to, to learn to understand what's going on from just doing a few examples rather than sort of formally stating the algorithm. So let's do that. So examples, do a bunch of examples. So each example, we'll, we'll, have, we'll start out with some P. So we have some P. And so let's take as our first example, let's take 0 0.35, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0.15, and 0 0.1. And the first step of, to applying the algorithm is to sort the probabilities in descending order. So I, I already have them sorted here. And now I'm going to write them. I'm going to I'm going to do all of these in a certain um, 
in a certain way to, so you can sort of see the pattern. So I'm going to do write it, write it out in this way. So I'm going to have my, my P of X or P I is, you know, same thing. 0 0.35, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.15, 0 0.1. And we have these sorted. And now I'm going to take the two, take two of the probabilities, which are the smallest. So in this case, there are only there are exactly two which are smallest. In general, you could have, you know, if there was another point, well, in that case, there would be two that were also smallest. But in general, there may be more than two. And so we're going to take those two and we're going to start to build a tree here. We're going to connect those up and we'll add those two probabilities. So we get 0.25. And now we do the same exact thing, but using instead of these guys, using these original three and the new one here. So we sort these in descending order. I won't, I won't rewrite it, but we can just see now that 0.2 and 0.2 are the smallest. So we do the same thing. We, we, we join those and those make 0.4. And now if we sort again, the two smallest are going to be 0.35 and 0.25. So we're, we're now considering only these guys right here. 0.35 and 0.25. So we combine, we combine those in our tree and what do we get we get we get point uh, let's see point five point point six and at last we combine the remaining two right we we only have point four and point six left and if we combine those we get one one point oh straight up so the procedure is a sort of it's a it's a recursive procedure and it builds this tree so after we've built the tree, the next step is to label these, each of these edges in the tree, each of these links. And I'm going to label them from left to right. It doesn't really matter uh, what order you do it, but you're going to give a label from your, uh, sorry, somebody's knocking at my door. Let me pause. I will be right back. Okay, we're back. So where were we? We're building this tree and each symbol in in the tree here, we're going to label these with symbols from our code alphabet. And so I should have mentioned here with the, for this example, let's take let's take B equal to two and the symbols in our code alphabet, let's take to be just be zero and one. So A is going to be zero one. So we'll just have a simple binary case here. Huffman works also for um, in general, and I'll describe how to do that. So we label each of these guys with a zero and a one. And of course, you know, I put, um, you know, for any given branching here from a node, it has each node has sort of two children and the, the children have to have the, the sort of edges uh, descending from it have to have different labels, of course. Okay, so we've labeled all of these guys. And now we're going to assign a code word in the following way. So we start out at the root. So this is this is the root of our tree right here. So the root. And then we 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 follow the path. So for the first guy, we follow the path and we get zero zero. So the code word for this one is zero zero. And then for this one we go one zero. So the code word is one zero. And for this guy, for this point two, we have one one. So it's one one. And then for, for this guy, we have, we have to go 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. And the last guy is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So that, th that defines our code words in the procedure. And you can see immediately that it's always going to be a prefix code because there's no code word that's sort of on the path from the root to another code word. So it's always prefix. And now let's let's figure out let's let's think about what is its expected length. So we can we can write down the length of each of these code words. Of course it's two, 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 three, and three. And let's write down what's the product. So we can take so if we're gonna compute L, L is the sum of the probabilities, probabilities times the lengths probabilities times lengths. So let's multiply this row here, the probabilities times this row, the row of the lengths. 
So what are we going to get? We got 0 0.2 times point, uh, 2 times 0 0.35 is 0 0.7. 2 times 0.2 is 0 0.4. 0 0.4 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.4 is 0 0.45. And then we get 0.3. And so we, we, we now add these up to compute our expected length. And what is it? Well, it's, let's see, it's, it's 0.7 plus 0.4 is 1.1 plus 0.4 is 1.5 uh, plus, uh, so that's 1.95 plus 0.3 is 2.25. 2.25, and it's bits since we are doing a binary alphabet. Now I have also pre-computed the entropy of this distribution. So the entropy of this P here, I have pre-computed for your convenience. And the base 2 entropy is 2.2016 bits. So indeed, well, we can verify at least that, you know, because we know that we have certain bounds on the length, the expected code word length of an optimal code. We know that we always are going to have that the entropy is less or equal to the optimal expected code word length, which is less than the entropy plus one. And indeed, it, in this case, it, 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 this, these bounds are verified in this case, that, that, they, that they do in fact hold. And this L it, for this PMF is the best possible expected code word length, even though the sort of ideal is this is the entropy you can't actually reach the entropy in this case because uh sort of the sort of rounding uh, you know because that you would need to have non-integer code word lengths to actually achieve the sort of ideal okay so that was a first simple example to give you the general idea and i'm going to do another video with several more examples but let's stop there for now and we'll because we're going to have a bunch more examples to do so you can really sort of see how the algorithm is applied in some different contexts. Okay, so I'll see you then.